Hi, folks. We're just given a few moments here at the top for Zoom to let everybody in to tonight's webinar before we get started with our event. If you are already in Zoom here with us tonight, uh, you can open up your chat window and let us know where you're Zooming in from. And you can also uh, purchase, find some more information about how to purchase books by tonight's authors. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Jared Alexander presenting his new book, Volunteers, Growing Up in the Forever War. He'll be talking with Jared Yates Sexton, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Jared, Jared and the team in Algonquin for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Although we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Volunteers, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Jared's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop that by link in the chat. Jared will also be stopping by Greenlight to sign books tomorrow, so please request a signed or personalized copy in the order comments of checkout online to purchase a signed book while supplies last, or stop by our Fulton Street store to pick one up in person. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Jared Yates Sexton, a writer and political analyst whose work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Republic, Politico, and elsewhere. He's the author of seven books, including American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. He currently serves in as, a, as an associate professor of writing at Georgia Southern University. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Jared Alexander. Jared has written for Esquire, Rolling Stone, The Nation, Narratively, and elsewhere. He holds an MFA in literary reportage from the New York University Arthur L. Carter School of Journalism. From 1998 to 2006, he served as a US Marine, deploying to the Mediterranean, East Africa, and Iraq. He grew up on military bases from the East Coast of the United States to Japan. He currently lives in New York City, but calls Atlanta home. In his debut memoir, Volunteers, Alexander reveals what it was like to be raised on war, vividly recreating the masculine fantasies of American heroism and patriotism that animated his childhood, and at the same time brilliantly dismantling those myths. Volunteers helps readers understand the violent and self-replicating mythology of American patriotism from the eloquent perspective of an enlisted man, not some elite warrior, but a simple volunteer. Jared is going to start us off with a reading from the book. 
Um, then he'll be talking with Jared and with all of you. Jared Alexander, please take it away. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Ken said we were going to war the evening the towers fell in New York City. Afterward, we hugged like brothers, then smoked cigarettes in the last air of summer and listened to the fighting Falcons patrol the vacant American skies. Three days later, Congress issued a joint resolution authorizing the President of the United States unilateral access to use the military at whim. The gloves are off, our leader said with relish. The leash has been cut. We were Marines, and one way or another, we wanted this. It didn't matter how or where or with whom, as long as we were there to earn a piece of its story. Ken was tall and wily with sergeant stripes pinned to the collar of his camouflage uniform. He was from Kentucky under the shadow of Cincinnati in a poor part of town, shotgun house poor. His daddy had been an army radio man in Vietnam. One of his high school teachers was a retired Marine Colonel. He had been raised with the banner of the military and American war draped around his shoulders. I was a corporal in his squad. We were both infantrymen, killers and war fighters and shock troops. At least that's what the Marine Corps called us. But we were not. <clears throat> Instead, the Marine Corps took our rifles and helmets and gave us gas masks and stretchers, charging our unit with evacuating Americans exposed to chemical and biological weapon attacks from terrorists and madmen. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were based in a sleepy outpost on the banks of the Potomac in Maryland, a short drive south of Washington, D.C. We spent our days training like firefighters and hazardous materials professionals. At night, Ken gathered the squad, me and Fields and Nagi and Big Joe and the rest. We blasted into DC or Baltimore or just the local redneck bars and drank ourselves into a chaotic haze, then returned zapped on adrenaline and youthful stupidity to run it off four or five miles, leaving behind a trail of sweat stench that reeked of beer and vodka and cigarettes. Our eardrums rang like bells from the nightclub outcast and the morning Marine Corps cadences of violence and glory. But as much as we said we wanted it, we were not going to the war. Still, we held out hope. We tooled into the heart of Capitol Hill in a column of white government trucks and buses before sunrise at the beginning of October. Letters filled with anthrax had appeared in mailboxes in Florida and New York at the offices of Senators Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy in Washington, DC, and at a nearby congressional mail facility. No one knew where the letters came from. We set up our tents and tables and equipment in the broad courtyard of the Rayburn House office building just south of the United States Capitol and across the street from the Longworth House office building. Our officers pulled us together and explained our role, to go office to office inside Longworth and collect dust samples from a few surfaces in each room and from the carpets with a special vacuum. Senator Daschle's office was inside Longworth and the entire building was assumed to be contaminated with anthrax. Those selected to go inside would wear full body hazmat suits with gloves, boots, and respirators. We wanted to go inside Longworth, just say we walked the halls of a U.S. congressional office complex filled with a biological weapon, the fulfillment of duty and the acquisition of personal bragging rights. We had taken scores of anthrax vaccine boosters. We had learned the symptoms of anthrax could cause sores on the skin with large black ulcers in the center, inflamed lungs that fill with fluid, bloody vomit and diarrhea if the bacterium entered the gastrointestinal intestinal system, lesions in the intestines and in the mouth and throat. We knew it could certainly kill us, and we wanted to be in the room with it because we knew, it, we knew that it could. In our military world, to be near a thing that can kill you is equal to riding the leading, leading edge of history. It, means a me, it, it, it was a means of demonstrating our worth in this world, a quiet, personal challenge of bravery, a point of pride, a chance to sweat in the suits for four or five hours, maybe six, to show our toughness in the absence of bullets and bombs that would soon fall in Afghanistan and who knew where else. Longworth became our own little battlefield. I eagerly, eagerly dressed in my gear when it was my turn. Marines doted on me as I prepared, securing my gloves to my suit with high grade duct tape, ensuring my boots were on comfortably, checking the charge on my battery pack. I put on my mask and turned on the purifier. Stale air blew against my face. The lenses tunneled my view and flattened the contrast. I stood still while a Marine taped the hood of my hazmat suit to the edge of my mask and closed the flapper around my neck. Then, sealed against the biological threat that might kill me, I walked toward Longworth alongside my partner, partner, a hulking sergeant nicknamed Big Baby. Ken and the rest of the squad were responsible for decontaminating us when we, when we came out of Longworth. They set up black rubber contamination pits the size of kiddie pools and used sprayers to soak us with high-test hyperchlorite, a high-powered bleach normally used to clean pools, before they cut us free from our suits. 
Someone joked that we might all end up with cancer because of it, but no one laughed. I passed Ken and the squad in their rubber pits and flashed, the, flashed deuces as we, as we made our way to the door. Big Baby and I were assigned to the second floor. The elevators were out, so we carefully climbed a broad staircase. We moved slowly, placed each step deliberately. A tear in our suits would mean a panic dash out the building and through a decontamination involving a rinse from a fire hose, a squad of pills, and a bevy of follow-up appointments with Navy doctors. A tall Marine staff sergeant named Poole waited for us on the second floor, ready to direct us to our line of offices for the day. Poole was a soft-spoken, genial man, a combat veteran of the Persian Gulf War in Somalia. It was rumored that he spent his entire time inside Longworth with a large wad of tobacco packed in his cheek with nowhere to spit it. We laughed and groaned at the thought of swallowing, but we also thought Poole was hardcore and we respected things that were hardcore. As we reached the top of the stairs, we found him bouncing a large ball of rubber bands against the marble wall. Poole assigned us to a length of rooms and we began to work. Every office appeared as if its inhabitants had been beamed aboard a starship or had just vanished in a puff of smoke. In their mad dash, the Congress people and their aides had left everything in situ. Computers were still on with the last website they had visited up behind their screensavers. Phones rang, televisions were on, fax machines spit out paper from constituents. The work wasn't difficult beyond the clumsiness of moving in a thick plastic suit and breathing filtered air. I lugged the small vacuum room to room while Big Baby wiped dust samples from varnished oak desks and dragged the vacuum nozzle on the carpet. The walls were covered in awards and state flags and pictures of sitting representatives and handshake shots with Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Ted Kennedy, Bob Dole, and Newt Gingrich. There were snapshots of smiling faces of Boy Scouts and Shriners and church leaders. There were plaques and law degrees from some of the best schools in America. Sports memorabilia, little pennants from the University of Arizona and Notre Dame. Signed footballs and baseballs set on bookshelves lined with bound bills and law books and bordered by ficus trees. I briefly sat in a congressman's plush, plush, plush leather chair. The novelty of sitting behind the desk of an elected official of the House of U.S. Representatives was not lost on me or even on Big Baby, who just wanted to get through the day as quickly as possible and go home to his wife and children, who were coming back tomorrow anyway. But it was poss impossible not to feel our nearness to the epicenter of American power. Any other day we would be locked up, locked away as trespassers. But today we walked through these abandoned offices entirely sanctioned, certainly resentful of their presumed political pettiness, but also secretly awed by their patriotic opulence. We were lance corporals and corporals and sergeants and staff sergeants from a million lower middle class nowheres across the American kingdom. And people like the people who sat in the chair we helped pay for had a nasty habit of killing people like us overseas for reasons no one bothered to fully understand. I grew up knowing it. I had little doubt Big Baby knew it as he bagged the next sample or that Ken knew it too as he waited for us to come out. The same went for every Marine in the courtyard on that cool October afternoon, some five weeks after the towers fell. But despite that, we knew we would go and kill and die or just come home shattered for America because we were Marines. Uh, thank you for that, Jared. I um, I loved hearing that as much as I loved reading it. I want to say before we get going, congratulations on writing uh, not just a book that, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. I, I I believe is generationally important, but beautiful and and incredibly well written. So for anyone who wants to get into this, it's it's an absolute joy to read. But I also want to go ahead and talk about the importance of this. I this is one of the first books that I have read, and I look for them, man. I, I look for the books that deal with not only the, the mythology of American militarism and American exceptionalism, but actually try and wrestle with the forever wars and this strange moment that we're in and the crises that we're dealing with and, and what goes into that. And I remember talking to you about this back in 2016, when we uh, were first cutting our teeth on political reportage at the Republican National Convention in Cleveland, Ohio. And you talked about your experiences and you were talking about this book that eventually you were going to write at some point or another. And again, congratulations on nailing it. But I wanted to ask, and I, would, I think a lot of people here would like to hear, why was it important to write this book? What was it that, that you felt compelled to do here? Because I feel like this is one of the more honest and really impactful wrestlings with all of this stuff. What was it about this that like you felt compelled to really get into? 
you know, when I, I started this project or I started the, what, what eventually became this project years ago. And I initially wanted to write something very typical for a veteran. And that is your, if I die in a combat zone by Tim O'Brien or in Pharaoh's army, you know, a, a very, very straightforward, almost wrote memoir about military service in a combat zone. Um, but every time I sat down to write it, I found myself getting dragged back into childhood a little bit. Like, cause it, it, it really, my war effectively started there. Like my, my combat sir, my combat time starts when I was a kid playing war in the, in the, in the, you know, the woods of military bases or around the, around the round base housing. And I kept, I kept putting that to the side. So, okay, let me, let me just write a, a section of that and then we'll put it away. Maybe we'll deal with that later and get back to the actual war. Cause I, was myopic in believing that the war itself was more important. Um, over time, though, as I evolved, I began to realize that no, what's what's missing in the in the in the I guess in the canon, if you will, is the kid, the kid walking his way to war in the United States, and that was something that I could not find anywhere else. And the, you know that that ultimately that became the sort of lodestar that I orbited. You know the the. Listen, what is it like to be a kid who wants to do this and then ends up doing it and what he learns in contrast to what he is expected, expected to see? Or, and on top of that, the literature also, you know, you have to understand, like I was reading a lot of anti-war literature and yet that also propelled me to go to war. So it did exactly the opposite of its intent. And that was something that I really wanted to kind of examine to, to an extent. Yeah. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time while I was reading this book thinking about how much I was indoctrinated into this stuff myself. You know, it was sitting at my grandpa's feet and hearing him tell stories about World War II. It was digesting a lot of the same literature, a lot of the same movies, you know, everything from child's entertainment with G.I. Joe up to the movies that I wasn't supposed to be watching. And it was all tinged with this religious type belief that there was something sacred and honorable about this, that there was some sort of a calling or some sort of a crusade that I, I was even being called to for a while. And I flirted with the possibility of going into the service. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that relationship, the indoctrination, the, the, the marinating in this, the absorbing all of this culture, and eventually what that leads to and how that puts you on the path to do something like this, and then maybe uh, find yourself lost in it at some point. I think to my own experience, it was enculturation. I mean, I was surrounded by it. There was nothing, any, 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 any other lifestyle or path was somewhat hazy and distant from me. Um, I, I, the Persian Gulf War is featured heavily in the, in the yeah. front part of this book. And, and that was something of a, of a, it galvanized my intent in a lot of ways. I had already, I had interest in, in, in fighter jets and that sort of thing. And we talk about a lot of, we talked about films. I can remember Iron Maiden and Top Gun being played ad infinitum in the house or, you know, and, you know, I'd go out and pretend to be those characters. And, and they were very jingoistic for, you know, very Reagan-esque jingoistic films. Um, the Persian Gulf War was where I saw it sort of real time. And it, was, it wasn't a production. It was a very real thing. And, but it was still filtered through a very red, white, and blue sort of filter and with, with these sort of rosy lenses. And I mean, the end of, that, end of that war was me, you know, with a bunch of other kids, you know, effectively singing patriotic songs to a group of, of people in, in the town I lived in. And, you know, it there was no getting away from it. You were, you were, you were chained to a lead. You were leashed to that subject. You were leashed to those, those virtues and ideas. Um, a lot of those virtues and ideas are, are, are honorable and still are today. Um, I think they, had a ten, they have a tendency to get warped by bad foreign policy or they get used or expended in bad foreign policy. Um, but you, you, there was no other alternative, quite frankly, at least for me, there wasn't. And for a lot of friends that I've known who've grown up in that world, you were going to go in the military. It wasn't, it wasn't by, uh, by force. You didn't have parents who were crowbarring their kids into it, but it's just what you knew. Um, I think it was the, there was a percentage of, the percentage of, of enlistees who go into the military, 70% of them, I believe, have had a, um, have, have a direct connection to the military. They've sat at their grandfather's knee and listened to those war stories. They've been exposed to that, that, that uh, the, you know, the imagery of it in a very, very filtered way. And I think it really, that's what propels a lot of us into the military. You know, I, my, my grandfather, when he, tell, he would tell the stories about, uh, you know, fighting Nazis in Europe and Africa, um, 
he would always tinge those conversations with the idea that fighting those wars was about ensuring a future without war. It was the idea, and I think to, to drill down at part of this, you, you said there's something honorable about it. The military, I think what's honorable about it is the idea of defense. It's the idea of, of protection against some sort of a threat that we live in a world where there are material threats that have to happen. But I will tell you, I was wrapped up in the Persian Gulf War as well as a child. I would go to school and we would have war games on recess. We would fight one another. And there was a, a gleefulness about destruction that I think a lot of people sort of, they downplay a little bit. The idea that this makes you feel strong that this makes you feel powerful. And one of the things that I found that was really interesting in your book, um, it was after you took the oath and you talked about how strong and large and powerful that you felt. And in a way, a lot of what's honorable, it feels like it's lost behind this personality or some sort of an expression of self or a character that you become. And I feel like this book sort of wrestles with that in a really interesting way that I don't, I don't see much of. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I, one of the things that really, I was really interested in exploring too, is the atavism of it. You know, you're talking about the, 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 the leaning into the destructive ends of it. You know, Martha Gellhorn, the, the journalist, the war correspondent has a, has a line in the preface to her collection of, of work. And she basically says that war is a disease. And I've always kind of pushed back against that gently. I think she's, she's very good at what she does, but I think she's wrong in this context. I think that <clears throat> when, we just, when we say that, what that does is it, it, cre it creates a pathogen out of war, as if some external agent infects us and then the symptom of that is us killing each other. Yeah. We do this. This isn't something that, 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 is, that is, we're not, you know, we can be manipulated into doing so and the, and the military is a part of that equation to, to an extent um, and our culture is to a larger one. But we decide to do this and we, you know, we have to, I think that, Looking at that at its face and looking looking directly at that will help us unravel the destruction that is war. Help us unravel why we do that. It'll, it'll, it'll give us a clear picture of the human psychology and the behaviors and the cultures and aspects of community that that decide to send its people into places where they can die and kill other people and deal with the moral injury of that. Um, and so I that was something that I really wanted to kind of tap at a little bit in this work is I wanted to sort of point and say, look, you know, I had no real interest in killing people, but at the same time, I was okay championing bombing or, or being involved in an organization that was doing those things. You know, I have no regrets over, over, over um, engaging with the enemy and missing none. I'm, I'm quite, quite fine with not having that moral injury. Uh, but at the same time, I definitely, and I knew that prior to going, going into, into, into combat that, I would be okay with that. But at the same time, I still went and I still experienced that and I wanted to do that. And that, and there's a lot of people, a lot of veteran friends that I know who can speak, who say the same. And I want that to, that needs to get its light, I think a little bit. Yeah, and, and a couple of things there. One, I'm so glad that you said we do this. I mean, speaking as Americans, this is something that we do. And, right. and we, we are, and, and I wanna be very clear, we're a militaristic country. And we have been for a very long time. I mean, for you to end up in Iraq, there are a lot of things that have to happen. And one of the most jarring moments in this, I actually, I had to like walk away from your draft or, or your arc when I read this for the first time. It's when you were talking about the actual war, you were being prepared for it. There was the disconnect between obviously what we were told Iraq was going to be, which was rolling in as heroes, which of course is the American fantasy. Everywhere we go, we're going to be welcomed as heroes because we are the heroes of history. But then you're shown the film, The Battle of Algiers. And for those who don't know this, Algiers was a colonial war. It was the French trying to put down a colonial insurrection. It was not clean. It was not pretty. It was not humanitarian whatsoever. It was barbarism. And that really surprised me to see that and then to watch it play out and for you to sort of come into what you term disillusionment, but you also wrestle with that a little bit. I think that's another uh, really interesting part of the book. 
to suddenly find yourself in a position to realize that the official line that led you to not only want to get to war, but end up in war and sacrifice large parts of your life, large parts of what was going on within your life, but also your own personal safety. I guess I'm wondering as somebody from the outside looking in, what is that like to suddenly have your eyes open in the midst of this? How do you, how do you, how do you reckon with that? How do you deal with the cognitive dissonance of it while you're still missing, you know, you're still dodging fire? Like, what is that? Yeah, that's, that's, I, st- I still laugh and struggle with that at the same time. And I think that demonstrates a certain dichotomy I have toward it because I, I was inverse to a certain degree. Like I, I knew by my understanding of Vietnam and then the the sort of uh, low intensity conflicts of the 90s, like Bosnia and Somalia, Kosovo, and, and I had a loose involvement in the Kosovo campaign. Um, you know, the I kind of came out of the opposite direction. I knew that we were going to get ourselves in, into conflicts that were inherently duplicitous or likely to fail, or they were going to be phoned in on, on dubious premises, premises or theses. And I was okay with that. And so the disillusionment that comes from that was almost, I felt like it was almost required of me to be so because the narrative arc of soldiers is always that. If I go back to Ambrose Bierce, he is saying the same things, you know, coming out of the Civil War. If I look at, well, Wilf, Wilford Owens is a bad example, but uh, Siegfried Sassoon, you know, Siegfried Sassoon goes to, comes out of the war and is disillusioned with the conflict. Um, I mean, the, 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 um, the book Rainy Generation is a great example of that if anybody's interested in, in learning about that. Um, you know, I look at James Jones or I look at Norman Mailer to an extent. Norman Mailer was a little bit too conservative to be disillusioned with the war. But um, James Jones certainly I think lost in that fantasy. He was sure. a little bit, especially on the masculine ends of it. You know, that was kind of his bag. Um, <clears throat> it became something of a, of a he became a, a, a stereotype. A monster. You know, and a monster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Late in the 70s, especially. But uh, yeah, so like, um, but no, I, I, I was sort of like dipped in that understanding that I was going to end up there. So everything was sort of inverse. Everything was happening in opposite, in, in opposite to each other. And, and so like the Battle of Algiers scene, I, you know, I, I was watching these people play this movie and this, this NCO describing what we were getting into before we even did it. You know, it was no mystery in the military what was going to happen post the, post the, the conventional campaign of seizing Baghdad. We all kind of had this sort of wink and a nod, like, you know, we're going to end up in an ugly counterinsurgency conflict that could last a long time. Um, and then, of course, El, Pro, El Paul Bremner and those guys sort of sanctified that with their bad decisions. Um, and the colonel being asleep in the back, like it all made sense to me. It was just it was like, yes, this is I, you know, I've read Catch 22. I had read it then. You know, I, I you know, I, I watched MASH. I saw Tour of Duty. I've seen Platoon. I had seen all the our literature, our, our cult, our, our art post World War Two with, you know, I would say probably post-1960, rather, is filled with stories that are about absurdity in the military. And I was seeing it everywhere. So I was almost expecting it to a certain degree. In fact, I had a tendency to be, I had a tendency to squint at people who didn't see that. Now, the, the dichotomy is, is that I was still functioning within it. And I was still, you know, I still believed in its core tenets. And I think that the people around me, I had a lot of faith in, and still do to a degree. Um, so I had this kind of yin and yang, moderate sort of straddling the line between both motivated to be there, but also disillusioned in the process of at the larger, larger scope of it. I knew that I had no way of changing the larger political landscape that led us to the wars, but I could certainly help participate on the local level with people who were being asked to fight them. And I wanted yeah. to participate in that. And, and on that note, I, I want to take this out uh, and take a wider view and then shrink it back in. Um, historically, I mean, obviously, the Vietnam War was this moment of recognition that the technocratic military, militaristic state of the United States of America um, was problematic, was not always on the right side of history, nor was it impervious. Of course, then you have the Persian Gulf War, which in large part uh, was carried out to sort of wipe away the bad taste of Vietnam and, and provide some sort of, of, of moment of respite or victory. We end up in the forever wars. Uh, we are now just uh, not too far a long way from Afghanistan, obviously falling back. Uh, we know what happened in Iraq. Um, 
to look at this is really to look at the forever war as the moment where that veneer fell off the mask slid right this was about um unethical unmoral pursuits uh, there is a, a guy named Danny Bessner, who I think is really, really smart in terms of uh, foreign policy, who has started to refer to a lot of this as imperial realism, which is that we no longer even clothe what we do in these best practices or in the heroic sort of mode. A lot of that mythology that you are sort of dealing with in this book has sort of fallen aside. And we even have some people who sort of revel in the brutality of war. We, we obviously have people, not just in uh, forever wars, but Vietnam and obviously other wars, people who take pleasure in the unrestricting of, of these animalistic impulses and the violence and all of that. What do you think are the ramifications of the forever wars and, and that sort of dichotomy starting to fall away? Like, what do you, how do you see that not only for America, but for the individual in the military? What are the, the consequences and repercussions of that? You know, one of the, the tragedies within the military, aside from its, its efforts in the forever war itself, is that after Vietnam, it rebuilt itself entirely from the ground up. It built a new non-commissioned officer corps. It revitalized its commissioned officers. It, 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 it created a training system that was really robust. And then it, 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 it allowed for a career opportunities within that. And it created a very professional and very, very good military. And then it went to the Persian Gulf War and executed its, it had limited goal, limited objectives. You know, it just wanted to eject a rock from, from Kuwait and then the war, and then did that. And it did that very well, and it did it very efficiently. Um, you know, like we, can make a, we can make an argument that perhaps it did it a little too good at times, but yeah. you know, that's kind of their job. Their job is to, quite frankly, cheat. That's the military's job on a battlefield is to cheat. And uh, that's how it wins battles. And, but what the real tragedy for me is after that, its own hubris got in the way again. It, one of the b- biggest things we need to understand is that it's, it's hubris to believe that lessons are absolute, that the lessons of Vietnam were going to sustain us post, uh, post Gulf War. As soon as 9-11 happened, all those lessons went right out the window. And every piece of advice the military ever had to give its civilian leadership on how to conduct a conflict like uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, or to perhaps not do so, or do so a little differently, was exchanged for, for we were attacked, quote unquote. You know, like it, it was sort of reduced to this very, you know, hammer meat nail sort of attitude for a long time. I mean, it was you know, well into the Obama years when that finally began to dissipate in our culture a little bit, but it still exists and in, in, in especially in conservative circles and in the neocon side of things. Um, you, you know, I, and that's, uh, that's the real tra- one of the bigger tragedies that I see in the military. Now, our culture does want this to an extent. You know, we, there's a certain amount of animosity and angst and, and ire it has toward, toward people who think that in order in or, that, that the military is an instrument of strength and therefore must be believed to be a singular star which we orbit you know i mean folks who were storming the capital on G- jan 6 were in league with that to a degree in some extent i mean there were veterans in that crowd who think that who have a very romanesque attitude about about the military cross the rubicon is something i hear a lot in the circles um and for anybody who doesn't know what that is that's where caesar basically takes the army and sacks rome and turns it into an empire um, you know, uh, so I see a lot of that in that culture, even now there's an idea that, that the only way to be smart is to be dumb, you know, and there, and, and by dumb by means by, I only kill enemy. I don't even try to engage with the situations that created them to begin with. Um, and there's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big thing in our culture. Even now I can think of like Navy SEALs of some note, uh, who were, who live in this space. And, um, you've seen quite a bit of that, the sort of attitude that, very myopic and very narrow-minded attitude that the only way to be an American is by killing somebody in another country. Um, our culture at large does that too, to an extent. I mean, we, we tend to distill patriotism into military terms. Why isn't, why isn't we, don't, we don't classify somebody who works at a community food bank as patriotic, but that is probably more patriotic or just as patriotic as the soldier fighting overseas. In fact, he's doing something to help an American. Whereas a person fighting overseas might not be. There might be they might be fighting for Iraqi freedom, that, or Afghan freedom, or, or or some other some other foreign policy measure that has nothing to do with uh, with uh, our interests. 
locally. And yet we're sort of paraded as patriotic and that the person who, who gives blood once a month or gives blood every six, eight weeks is not. And I think that that's, that's very telling. Yeah, I think about the tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy. I mean, that, 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 that's the really awful thing here is on one hand, the violence that is done around the world is uh, almost unfathomable in, in, in its tragedy, but also there, the soldiers and the veterans who come back are so mistreated, they're so disposable. Everyone wants to talk about saluting the troops or giving them you know, some sort of support. Uh, that, that only goes as far as it doesn't cost money, it doesn't cost resources, it doesn't cost energy. On top of that, people often come back, uh, they're frustrated. Uh, we, we've seen after all of these major conflicts, when veterans come back, the ones who are disillusioned, all of a sudden they start looking at society and they start saying, uh, I mean, after World War I, it was the trenchocracy idea, the idea that all society should be guided based on militaristic principles. And the only people who deserve rights are veterans and the people who go and fight. It is such a massive stew of tragedy that just compounds on one another. And I don't think that you can look at where we are right now without understanding all of these all of these things that you're talking about. I think I think that is the the defining thing of the moment, really. Right. You know, it's funny. I, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I, I think that the best patriotism is usually quiet patriotism. And then if the louder it gets, the cheaper it tends to be. Like a like, patriotism shouldn't have a production budget. You know, if we want to put it in those terms. You know, like you were talking about the the, the sort of the sort of treatment of veterans post war. You know, I think that I, I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think one of the one of the flaws we have in our culture is we don't allow them another identity. You know, they come back and they're veterans. They have to adopt every stereotype that that, that implies. And that can vary from from the reductive or it can you know, it can be lionized, um, but they don't get to quite come home and just plug into another just general identity of an American citizen. They have to kind of embody that spirit a little bit sometimes and i've experienced that in my own life i've tried to downplay that aspect of my life to a certain degree um but when it comes up you can see the you can see a change in the individual very quickly um and that's always a little distressing because it's alienating to a veteran now on the you know on the more fiscal side of things the va obviously you know needs overhauling to a degree and especially in rural areas where the va is just badly managed and typically you know just underpowered but healthcare in those areas is underpowered as it is. So it's, it's, a, it's a little hard to make a comparison, or a little hard to say that they are worse off than say somebody who doesn't have healthcare at all. Um, but that's one of the things, I mean, we talk about like, you know, I mean, in our circle, in veteran circles, you tend to hear a lot about veteran suicides. And part of that is because of trauma, PTSD is a large part of that. But I think that the way we ingest veterans into our culture after the fact, it's really, clumsy and, and um, quite frankly, incomplete. And I think that if, if you can do that, some of, the, some of that ire that you're seeing in, in places like in Jan 6, or you know, if you want to get to a more, more absolute, absolutist view of that, the, the, the collapse of the Weimar Republic and use the Wehrmacht to, and the use of World War I to prop up the, the, the NDSP. Um, those kinds of stabbed in the back mentalities um, can be lessened if we could bring them back and allow them to integrate the society a little bit better. Yeah, it gives them power and some sort of belonging. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Ryan has asked a good two-part question. Uh, one is how does all this activity lead to uh, tribalism at home? I think uh, Foucault's boomerang would talk about how the brutality abroad always comes back home in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but also where American military went from defensive to reactive. Um, I'm not a military expert. I, I would probably say the Mexican-American war, but uh, then maybe that's going back a little too far and being a little too pessimistic. Where, where do you come down on those two things? Right, the Mexican-American war is a good example of going from defensive to reactive or going to a proactive. Actually, it's probably a better term that time yeah. because the Mexican-American war was literally a power as a land grab, right? We started that. We right, started. that's us. We got to own that. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we own that war you know um and it you know created a lot of the leaders that end up fighting 20 years later in the civil war um that was a but i think that that was a unique case for the period now i don't know that's even troubling to say because I, I can think of some of the earliest points of the monroe doctrine where we're very proactive to a degree on the, yeah. on the on the local level um 
But we did have a period there where we tended to avoid avoid war. We were very isolationist. We did not want to get into World War One until it became, a, you know, a hazy imperative to do so. We had to get crowbarred into the Spanish American War by the the the, the, the issue with the Navy and. Um, you know, it, it wasn't until at post World War II where I think that we really became, you know, very proactive and bellicose. And then this idea, of, I think, I think that Nazi Germany and the Empire of Japan sort of scared us a little bit or made us very nervous. And of course, the atomic bomb didn't help that. And and then you know, geo, geopolitics start taking center hold. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. well, you you think of the attitudes of guys like General Curtis LeMay, who was you know bombing back. To, you know, he just wanted to flatten the earth with bombers and he would rather do that first than than engage in some sort of diplomatic overture think of that think of um a Cuban missile crisis is a good example of that you know you know and that and that and that attitude carries over into other places what i think is astounding is the absolute hubris of the generals that led us into vietnam yeah. you know paul harkins and, and his attitude toward the vietnamese and his relationship with zm which sets the framework for like free fire zones for indiscriminate bombing of Vietnamese villages and that sort of thing, which then Westmoreland just picks up, who was his, who was his aide or his second in command, picks up and just makes a whole mess out of it when the troops land. Um, you know, there was a, it was incredibly uh, myopic and just arrogant to assume that our firepower was somehow going to quell uh, uh, an independent, a war of independence like that. But I think that really in our, in our in a more modern sense, I think 9-11 gave, gave us the thought that we need to be bombing other people for our own internal security. And I think that we as a people have sort of allowed that to exist. I mean, look, there have been reporting, there have been some great reporting on civilian casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan for, for quite a number of years. The Uncounted is a great one. Uh, Osmet Khan, I believe is uh, the one of the pair of that who put that together. And what, you know, what they did with that is incredible in demonstrating what we are doing and the gaps in our intelligence and the indiscriminate way in which we're using our firepower. Um, and that is an indicator of that. That is an indicator of a proactive measure of trying to eliminate something we can't, uh, you know, we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it with, with significant ground power because that would disrupt the, the, the order of our lives here in the United States, which is relatively checked out of this conflict. So we're doing it on the cheap effectively. And therefore, and because of that, we don't have the intelligence apparatus and, the, and the, the, uh, the, the, the targeting we need to be able to do it accurately. And so we just start bombing houses that we think might have an ISIS you know, operative in it or, or a cell. So yeah, I would say that 9-11 is probably the, the, the marker for that with, but with examples going back to say the Mexican-American war to draw on, yeah. to give us some legal cover. Yeah, and and I think and and T. Melamo is is asking about what what sort of mythologies of, of militarism and, and military conflicts have have played into our current understanding. And I think uh, going to what you were saying, we we keep going into these conflicts believing somehow or another there's something inherent about America that will get us through and will win. Like like the Viet the Vietnamese thing is just shocking that you cannot defeat a national revolution of independence by bombing it that does not work but it's the hubris of it would, would, would you agree on that front absolutely yeah i mean i mean ho chi Minh said it quite frankly he's like look you might kill 10 of me to every one of yours but i'm going to win and you're going to lose and he knew that i mean it improved it and then to i mean his his ability to you got a hand of the vietnamese or ability to sacrifice their own people for what they want is astounding their yeah. national will would was never going to be beaten by ours especially our, just by our firepower. Um, that is, is, is shocking to me that we would think that that's possible. And it created an incredibly dark conflict. I mean, Vietnam, of, we give World War I a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of talk about it being a very ugly war. But I think Vietnam is probably one of the ugliest wars we have ever fought in. I, I, I can't think of another, another example that's that brutal. Civil War was bloody, but it was- But at least those are like, at least those are challengeable armies and belligerents right and and the the the, despite the nuances of it the united states in the civil war had a moral foundation for the war they were fighting while it didn't start that way it grew into the into the the uh it grew into what it became with the uh, end of slavery 
Um, I mean, it's all in the great writings of the period. Grant talks about that, how he started out effectively, just, I just want the union to stay in existence. I don't really care about the issue of slavery. And then eventually he translates into, look, this has got to go and we got to burn it out. So that gives a war a moral foundation. They didn't do it for that purpose, but they understood that that's what was going to help in their conflict, aside from the industry of the North. You know, Vietnam had none of that. It was, it, 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 U.S. leaders foolishly assumed that stomping communism was a moral, moral act in and of itself, irrespective of the cultural dynamics that created the war to begin with. Um, you can usually, I haven't put my finger on it exactly yet, and I've been sort of examining this and, and trying to read about it, but I think that there's a kind of, there's a, there's a certain note that a moral war, a just war takes. You can feel it in the, in the pulse of the conflict, even if some of the minutia might be a little messy. Yeah. Persian Gulf War had elements of that. Yep. Um, you know, the way that Iraq invaded that country and brutalizes people created a moral, a moral justification for that conflict that cannot be really, in my view, can't be, it's hard to, hard to argue. Um, what comes after is a little different, however. The minute we won that war, we turned into a bellicose nation by virtue of our sanctions and no-fly zones and you know, the, we're going we're gonna to allow you food if you sell us gas kind of operation that we were running later on in that, in that, in that um, sort of uh, detente we have that country before we invaded it in 03. Um, that's where the polarity shift changes, I think. You know, we ended up going from a moral defender to a morally questionable aggressor. You know, there might have been other ways of dealing with Saddam rather than, rather than uh, starving his people. Well, and that, that Cold War lends itself to all morality that you can possibly ever imagine. I mean, you can't look at the Persian Gulf War without looking at the fact that we aided and enabled Saddam Hussein. And oh, as God. we fought the Persian Gulf War, he's fighting us with weapons and intelligence and technology that we gave yes. him. And so, yeah, it, it comes from that, I think, American idea of we know better. We know best. We are the moral champion and we just we need to have our hands in all things mm -hmm. uh to take a, a a quick turn elizabeth cantrell i think asked a really good question which i think uh should be asked of every book i think this is one of the more fascinating things about writing a book which is uh what was it like to visit your younger self but also as you're writing a book it takes a long time it's a it's a huge process what did you feel changing about yourself as you're doing it, particularly as you were uh, digesting your own trauma and sort of going through, you know, the past and who you were and who you are now? One of the things that when I walked into this project, one of the things I really, it was a, it was a rule I had for myself, probably one of the, the top of the list of the rules is I had to put myself on trial as much as anybody else that I couldn't put something down that judged with 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 a couple of exceptions that judge them while not judging me i needed to make sure of that i also know that i had to leave it all on the table as much as i could look there's 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 another third of a book that's not here you know there's there's never mind just the edits and cutting of, of words and trimming down paragraphs and making them as high as possible there's a lot that was left on the floor um that went into even like relationships as it relates to the military and the sort of like, and even as a kid, like the hero complex and the, and the sort of toxic ends of, the, of, of, of masculinity that, that forms in childhood and then grows from there. Um, you know, there was a little bit of that that was left because it couldn't, it was, we were crowbarring it in a little bit, but that was one of the things. So that, what that requires though, if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to be as critical of yourself or as, or try to put yourself down as honestly as possible because it requires some distance. You need to create somehow, and, and it's tough to do, but you got to create a little bit of distance from the subject and kind of be an observer of your own experience as much as you were a participant of it in the time. You know, a lot of folks ask me, did I write this for therapy? And I, I, I didn't, that wasn't my objective. It was, it was really, a, a, I wanted to analyze the subject of my childhood as it relates to the war and analyze the war itself and then put those two together in the same, the same project, the same on the, put it on the same canvas. And that required me stepping back. And the further I was able to do that, the easier the work became and the easier I was able to find moments of specificity and universe that, that were very universal to the child experience. Like I grew up around the military, but I think that the, the, aspects of my childhood like riding bikes and doing those sort of things were, were universal to a lot of people and i tried to find those things and i don't think i could do that 
if I was too tight to it. The emotions would be, I would be manipulating the emotions of the story. I would be trying to, you know, what um, uh, we, we sort of, we sort of refer to tipping the scales a little bit in one favor, one character or another, or, or, or making a moral, making a moral judgment over one person over another. And I couldn't do that. It needed to be even. And I needed the distance to do that. So I want to say real fast, uh, everybody should pick this up. And not just because it is inherently important. And again, congratulations on that. I really admire what you were able to do here. It's incredibly well written. And what I will say, and I'm going to get to Rachel Canberra's question here. Um, I picked this up and I was shocked by how little war there was to it. It's not war pornography. And a lot, that is its own genre, like trying to transport people almost like a, a virtual reality program to give them the, uh, almost the pop culture type of war experience that people want, almost a voyeuristic look at it, right, from somebody who was there. And I thought that you did an incredible job with the background of it while minimizing that effect and the glorification of it. And Rachel Canberra says, uh, with volunteers marking something of a new era of contemporary war literature, and God, I hope so, what stories do you hope to see published in this space going forward? What, what stories need to be told and what needs to happen in order to make this better and make the understanding more complete? One of the things I, I, I'm a big believer in, and I, I would love to figure out a way to do it myself, to be quite frank. So I hope nobody steals the idea. But uh, <laughs> um, I would love to see a, a from here, like a, a sort of a, a modern from here to eternity. Yeah. Um, I think that a, an examination of like a biopsy of that culture of the military outside of war itself. But yeah. like as it exists and why it exists the way that it does would be an interesting subject. Um, to me, and that's because I, I, I'm steeped in the literature, and I think that that's an under under underappreciated avenue, and it's only been done a few times. You know, I can think of, you know, I, from here to eternity, obviously, and then there's, you know, um, oh, what is the name? Uh, there's a couple others. I, I have Buffalo Soldiers is another one that I can think of that's was made to a film a few years ago. Um, so it's kind of an underappreciated and under underutilized uh, plat uh, canvas for a story. Um, War itself is kind of nice if you ride around it a little bit. I also think that it would be interesting to talk about people who like stolen valor cases. You know, why do people, I mean, what, we have this kind of, we have this, we have folks who wear uniforms because who are not soldiers or veterans who wear kind of a hodgepodge version of a uniform because they're trying to connect to that thing. Um, some of it, quite frankly, some of it I think is maybe a, a marker of, of uh, you know, uh, hard times that that person has fallen into. There could be a mental illness that's there that needs to be examined and treated. Um, but I think it would make for an interesting story is something about, you know, folks who want to be soldiers, but for whatever reason, couldn't, can't, or just didn't. And that is prolific in our culture. I mean, we have, we've had news broadcasters who have paraded their service, not their service, but their, their proximity to combat yeah. as a, as a, as currency as a currency of, 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 you know, authenticity. And I think that that's worthy of exploring. That'd be an interesting aspect to look, look at. There's a lot of that. That colors a lot of our, our coverage for sure. I think we have uh, time for one last question. And by the way, great question so far. Uh, wonderful event, Jared. I, this has been a real honor for me. Uh, from Kimber, uh, is there an opportunity to accept the past and present cultural narrative of American military power and create an effective or positive story for its use in the future? Or are we hopelessly down a path we can't undo? Where is there a place that we can do good? I think that just in the way that I wrote this, I suppose, you, we need to have a, a, a body of officers and civic leaders who are willing to study our own history yeah. as it relates to foreign policy, honestly, with and, and public and an open forum and without partisanship. Yeah. You can look, this is what we did. Here are the ramifications of our behavior long term. You know, our, like we were talking earlier about, you know, us trading with Saddam in the 80s. Well, we our hubris sort of told us that we knew right what we, we knew what was right for right now not for what was going to be right 10 years from that or 20. It's one of the biggest frustrations I've ever had with, with our government is it tends to go for the short sell. You know, it tries to, it tries to capture a, 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 some kind of short-term objective without thinking about the 30, 40, 50 years down the road. Part of that's just the make of our democracy in terms of the way our, our election cycles work and that. But also I think it's just, we just don't know how to think about, we don't have foresight. 
And that's always been something that, that's frustrated me. But I do think like an honest appraisal of our, of, our, of our world, an honest appraisal of our history and where we fit into the world. And, and I think that's the way to do that. I think the military is capable of that. They do have, they can, when they apply themselves, they can do an honest, they can do an honest evaluation of their, of, their, of their belief systems, of the way that they approach conflicts, of their relationships with uh, Capitol Hill and their relationships with the, you know, the larger ind industry of the military. And they can start to evaluate these things and make changes. They are good at that. There are officers who are very good at that. I mean, look, the, the, the guys who came out of, out of uh, Vietnam did that. Yep. And they created a military that was pretty good. Yeah, and the autopsy of, of the Iraq war shows that all of the people who knew better said better. It was just a matter of political forces. I mean, they told them it was not going to be that easy, nor was the mission actually real. I mean, it was simply a matter of it being heated, right? Right. Well, I think that I think that also that the, the American people need to get engaged with this. Yeah. And if, without that, nothing can get done. You have to it has to come from both ends. You can have military leaders talk all day long about how things need to be changed, how how how, how policy needs to change to a particular form to to a war. But if the American people aren't asking for the same thing, those are the people who pay the bills, yeah. either in votes or in tax dollars. And if they're fine with it, there's not a lot of impetus for a civic leader to make those changes. Yeah. And, and it feels very much like not just the forever wars, but I mean, my God, how many countries are we active in right now? It's, it's an offshore situation. And, and, and it's not even actually always soldiers at this point. It's also contractors. It's also these people who are paid to go out. We don't hear about them dying. And then on top of it, America has isolated themselves. It's one of the reasons why we have drone warfare. Uh, we want to be able to have all of this stuff without the ramifications of it or sacrifice. That's right. That's absolutely right. I, you know, it's, it's a bit of a third rail, I think. I don't think it's a political reality, but having some sort of, you know, a civic engagement with the military or with just our government in general terms is probably should be required to a degree. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean conscription, but it should mean some sort of, you have to participate in this. You need to know what's going on and you need to know why we're doing things and you need to question it when, when those things are amoral. Yeah, I, f I find it very interesting that the most that the uh, civilian population has engaged with the military was when there was a draft in Vietnam. And then you saw a lot and you see a lot of the protests go away the moment the draft does. I, I think right. that's telling. I think that's telling. That's absolutely right. You saw the minute they got rid of the draft, there was no more interest in, in, in protesting war because they had no personal stake in the wars that we were fighting. Yeah, it's blue jean or rock and roll time. That's right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jared Alexander. Uh, again, the book is Volunteers. Uh, I, I cannot tell people how much they should buy this. This is an incredible book and Greenlight Bookstore, fantastic bookstore. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, thank you both so much for such a fantastic discussion and thank all of you for joining us. Uh, a reminder again that you can buy volunteers from Greenlight either in store. We're open 10 a.m. to 7 p.m on Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave or at greenlightbookstore.com for quick local in-store pickup or for shipping anywhere in the US. Uh, I'm pasting that buy link in the chat again with a reminder that uh, Jared is also coming in to sign books tomorrow. So starting tomorrow, you can uh, find signed copies at our Fulton Street location or you, you can request a signed copy and order comments online when you check out. Thank you all so much again uh, for sharing this space for conversation and connection with us tonight and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye everybody.